Hi everyone, this is Daniele Serra from the University of Pisa and I welcome you to the popular science talk of the uh, global virtual workshop of the project Stardust R. Um, before starting this talk, I would like to thank the organizers for inviting me to give this talk. And uh, of course, if you have any questions, I will be glad to answer those at the end of the talk. Um, and you can write all your questions in the live chat on the side of the, of the video. So, the title that I chose for, the, for this talk is The Next Decade of Solar System Exploration. In this title, we have three main ingredients. The solar system, the solar system exploration, and the next decade. My aim here tonight is, first of all, to present to you our solar system, First of all, um, second, to um, tell you something about the exploration of the solar system and, of course, to focus on what will happen in the next 10 years. But first, let's, let's start from the beginning. Now, uh, as many of you, I'm sure many of you have experienced a uh, um, lockdown in the, in the last months, and many of you have occupied their days and their nights uh, watching many TV shows, TV series. And so I really, at least I did, and so I really can't help by starting with previously on solar system exploration. Well, it must be said that the humankind has always explored the solar system. Already the, in Babylon, um, they were on Earth, of course, they looked at the sky and they were able to discriminate between the stars, which were fixed in the, in the sky, and the planets, which moved with respect to the stars. And so they filled tablets with complicated calculations in order to um, predict the future positions of these celestial bodies. Another milestone for solar system exploration is, of course, the invention of the telescope by Galileo Galilei. As you can see in the top, uh, I'm sorry, in the bottom uh, left picture. Of course, that opened many new ways to solar system exploration. Even by staying on, her, on Earth, on the ground, we could, we could see, they could see, uh, celestial bodies much closer and even make many discoveries, such as uh, the famous Galilean moons, which are the satellites of planet Jupiter, and um, the craters of the, Earth, uh, of the moon, of course. And finally, another milestone, another incredible milestone, which opened the... Uh, the, the greatest discoveries about uh, our solar system is, of course, the launch of the first ever artificial satellite in space, which was the Sputnik here pictured um, on the right. Since the launch of the Sputnik, of course, uh, there was the beginning of the Cold War, of the space race, yes, but of, co of course, it was also the beginning of a golden era for the exploration of the solar system. Um, I'm not going to talk about, of course, all the space missions between 1957, which was the year the Sputnik was launched, and today, because I want to focus on what is going to happen in the next 10 years. But I just want to point out one space mission which struck me when I was a kid, and it was so much inspiration for my job nowadays. And I'm talking about Voyager. Voyager was a NASA space mission, actually is a NASA space mission, and I'm gonna tell you why in a minute. Uh, made up of two uh, different um, spacecraft, launched in the, towards the end of the 1970s, a few weeks apart from each other. And they explored, they were able to fly by the giant planets of our solar system. 
And this was, to me as a kid, incredible because they delivered many, many beautiful pictures. For example, you can see here a, a little movie uh, depicting the approach of one of the two Voyager um, satellites to Jupiter. You can see here on the right, planet Saturn. And um, moreover, Voyager 2 was the only spacecraft uh, which was able to see, to fly by, planets Uranus and Neptune, delivering these two amazing pictures which are nowadays the only pictures, more or less, um, of these two magnificent planets. And keep that in mind, because I'm going to take this back uh, towards the end of this talk. Where are they now? Well, Voyager 1 and 2, as, a, as I was saying, are a space mission, because they are still working, and they are... Um, they, are, they will work until at least 2025. And they were the first artificial um, satellites to exit the solar system. As you can see here in this picture, the solar system, very, very small, at the center, you can see the sun, a very, a very pale yellow dot, um, and there is this area around it called heliosphere where the sun let's say dominates and uh, the heliopause which is the boundary of this of this region um, designates the end of the solar system so now voyager 1 and 2 exited the solar system and are in interstellar, interstellar space they were the and they are still flying away from the the solar system So, as I said, I'm not going to talk about all the other space missions um, uh, between 1957 uh, and now, but here I'm going to summarize them. Uh, actually, this is a chart uh, which is updated only to 2016, so there are some missions missing, and there are no, there, there are no missions around the Earth, which are, of course, hundreds. So you have an idea of how many probes, how many satellites the humankind has launched to space to explore the solar system. So since Galileo, we have, we have made many progresses. Now we are able to launch spacecraft that are going to planets. They are going to, they, they can orbit the planet. They can um, go on the surface of the planet or they can just fly by the planet. There are many possibilities. But before going into detail with the, um, with the uh, space missions that were going to happen in the next 10 years, I want to present our family, our solar system. It, because many of you maybe are familiar with this. Of course, many of you are, are, are experts, so this uh, is no new information. But, but um, for those of you who are just curious, this is our family. So we have the Sun, which is a star, which, which is the largest object in solar system. And we have then from the left to the right, the first four planets, which are called the terrestrial planets because they're made of rocks which are Mercury, Venus, Earth, and Mars. In the same region, we have three satellites, the Earth's moon, which we all know, of course. And then we have two satellites of Mars, Phobos and Deimos. Going away from the Sun, there is a region of space called asteroid belt, called actually main, main belt, because asteroids are not only in that region. And I'm going to go back to this point in a while. And here we find a population of many small rocky metal bodies which orbit the Sun. And the most important are there, Ceres, Pallas, Juno, Vesta. 
Then there is a huge region of, um, of the solar system where there are only four giant planets and their satellites. And we find Jupiter, which is the largest planet, Saturn with its amazing rings, Uranus and Neptune. So the planets of the solar system are eight. Beyond Neptune, we have the Kuiper Belt, which is another region of space populated with many other bodies made um, of ice, because the further from the sun, the more ice we find in the bodies. And among the, these trans-Neptunian objects, we find also the former planet Pluto, which is now considered a dwarf planet, its uh, satellites, for example, Charon is the most popular, and then we have other bodies. Oh, beware, because the distances here are not real. Uh, it looks like Venus is equally distant from Mercury and the Earth, or Saturn is equally distant from Jupiter and Uranus. This is not true. You find in the bottom the relative distances between the bodies. And as you can see, the first four bodies are really close to each other. And the further you go from the Sun, the more distance there is between the planets. So Neptune is about 40 times, I think, um, the distance from the Earth to the Sun. Now, before going into detail with space exploration, let me answer a question that once my uncle at a dinner, at a family dinner, asked me. Why funding space exploration? Why putting so much money in it? After all, we're going away from the Earth. It's so far away from us. Why should we do this? Well, the answer, the, the, the answer that I consider acceptable, the only answer that I consider acceptable, I could say, is this one. Exploration is a human need. It's something that comes from within. It's something that we've always done. And we can stop exploring. Since ancient times, men and women kept on being curious and inventing, exploring the world from their, their small land, continents, uh, crossing the oceans, the seas. We cannot stop now only because we're going away from our planet. And this is my answer. But of course, we're living in a capitalist world, so I, I can give you um, an answer for the capitalists, enthusiasts. Uh, well, space is useful because we can um, develop new technologies. Of course, space is a very harsh environment. Just think of Mercury, which is the closest planet to the sun, or Venus, which is uh, uh, which with its greenhouse effect has a, a surface temperature of thousands of degrees, or uh, Jupiter with its radiation. It's a very unbearable environment. And if you want to send a spacecraft to those places, you need to develop new technologies. And those technologies eventually will be useful in the everyday life. And then, of course, we have the answer for the pacifist. Space exploration fosters international cooperation. So we can say, make space exploration, not war. And we have seven, I will give you several examples of cooperation between nations in this talk. So now we're ready to start talking about the next 10 years of space exploration. We'll, we will see for each, of the, not, for each of the bodies, more or less, that I presented to you, one or more missions we, that, that will happen in the next 10 years. And we'll see what they are going to find, what we're going to learn about those bodies. But I forgot a word in this question, and the word is hopefully, because of course, space exploration is made by humans, 
and of course um, there can be flaws there can be mistakes um, technologies might not work as we expected so what I will be talking about is just what will happen if everything goes uh, smoothly and one example uh, as to why this word hopefully is necessary is given by the Galileo mission to Jupiter. Now Galileo was a great space mission. It was sent to planet Jupiter but it also made many flybys of its satellites. And so it was set to teach us many many things about about Jupiter and about the Jovian system. Um, you can find it here in a picture on the left with this great umbrella-like antenna which should have opened and sent ma much, many, many data, much, much information to Earth. The problem is life is real and unfortunately, as you can see on the right, the antenna didn't open up. So, well, uh, let's be clear, the Galileo mission wasn't a failure. It wasn't a failure at all. We still learned so much about the Jovian system. But we had to make do with fewer data, with less information, which, with slower communication, and this, of course, uh, was detrimental to the result, to many results uh, of the space mission. So let's start from the sun, of course, from the star of our solar system. So the sun is a star. You can see it here, you can see it here on the right. And it's the largest body in the solar system, of course, and it comprises 99.8% of the mass of the solar system. So the rest of the planets, all the minor bodies, is only 0.2% of the solar system. Here you can see uh, some close-ups of the Sun. Actually, about the Sun, we know many things. And we learn this by looking at other stars in the sky, for example. So we know how it formed, we know the interior structure and composition, we know the mechanism driving the radiation, which is currently studied at school, at high school. So, what, what we don't know? Solar winds. So solar winds are basically streams of high-velocity charged particles. So we have these particles ejected by the sun, which can travel with very, very high velocities through space. They can arrive, of course, in the neighborhood of the Earth. Now, the fact is that we don't know exactly what drives the winds. And we don't know why the particles have such high velocity. What is the cause of the acceleration? And this is very important to know because the solar winds, which are shielded, um, which actually... Uh, don't affect much the Earth because the Earth is shielded by its uh, magnetic field, um, can nevertheless uh, damage spacecraft orbiting the Earth and cause, for example, interruption in service of satellites and so on and so forth. So we want to understand this better. Um, it's we know that the solar winds are connected in some way with the magnetic field of the Sun, which is here represented as this complicated um, picture. We don't know exactly how it originated, and we don't know how it propagates in the solar corona, which is the region of the Sun um, far from its surface. And in order to answer this, these questions, the European Space Agency and NASA launched, actually earlier this year, February 2020, Solar Orbiter, 
which is a spacecraft. Here you see on the right the an image of the launch, and a spacecraft which will operate until 2030. And to answer the previous questions, of course, um, Solar Orbiter has to fly very close to the Sun. And in fact, it will be the closest object to fly to the Sun. It will also be the first spacecraft to picture the Sun's poles. And this is because the poles is where the magnetic field um, changes, inverts the poles. And this happens once every 11 years. We have seen this. Why does it happen? How does it happen? What does it happen there? Uh, Solar Orbiter will give us the answer. Here you see a plan of the orbits of Solar Orbiter, which, he, which has this very nice uh, and elliptic polar orbit, meaning that it will fly over the poles of the Sun. And actually, the close-ups of the Sun that I showed you earlier, they were taken by the Solar Orbiter, in fact. Let's move on. Let's go to the inner solar system. Here it is. These are all the bodies. So, top left, you see the planets. Mercury, Venus, the Earth, and Mars. I'm sure you, recon you recognize the Earth. Mercury is the smallest. Venus is the one similar in size to the Earth, and Mars, of course, is the red one. Then on the right you see the Moon, which is our natural satellite, and then top, um, sorry, bottom left you see Phobos and Deimos, which are uh, Mars satellites. They are so different from our Moon. Actually, they look like they don't belong there. Almost as if they were objects captured by Mars, by Mars gravity. And in fact, this is one option. Um, let me show you, let me focus your attention on Phobos. You see there are stripes on its surface. Well, those stripes are caused by Mars, by the tides exerted by Mars on Phobos. And those tides eventually, unfortunately, will tear Phobos apart. It will be destroyed by those tides. So we, are, as humankind, are very lucky to live in this day and age where we can see Phobos. In several million years, if there will be humans on the Earth, they will not be able to see Phobos anymore. Why study the inner solar system? Well, of course, because they are our neighbors and they were formed more or less in the same time as the Earth was formed. So understanding um, how the other planets were formed, how the other planets um, are inside, the chemical composition, the interior structure, helps us understand why the Earth is there. And I'm going to present two space missions to the inner solar system. The first one is Bepicolombo. BepiColombo is a space mission of the European Space Agency and the Japanese Space Agency. So, here, cooperation between nations. Um, Mercury is the least explored amongst the, in the, the terrestrial planets. It was explored like three times, more or less. Uh, what will BepiColombo do? Well, the, the last time the human kind explored um, messenger, sorry, Mercury, was with the messenger uh, mission by NASA, which ended just five years ago, in 2015. So you say, why sending another space mission? Well, messenger was a very good mission. We learned a lot from messenger. But in fact, messenger was only able to collect data from uh, Mercury only in the northern hemisphere. Um, in the picture here on the left, which represents the gravity anomalies of, of uh, Mercury, never mind, you, you see that the data represented 
are very, have very high resolution in the northern part of Mercury, that is Mercury, and very poor resolution in the southern hemisphere. BepiColombo will provide data from the whole planet. Actually, BepiColombo was launched in 2018 and it will arrive at Mercury in 20, towards the end of 2025. The mission will last like one year, possibly um, extended for another year. And it's made up of two orbiters, so it's a very complicated mission. And it will explore the interior structure of Mercury, the rotation state, the magnetic field of Mercury, the interaction with the solar winds, again, the solar winds. Here on the right, you see a video taken by the Bepi Colombo camera during its flyby with the Earth. Here on top, that is our home. And as a bonus, I really uh, couldn't help uh, naming this because it's what I'm working on right now we also get a general relativity experiment. So this is more uh, about fundamental physics. It's not, um, about, the, uh, it's not about planetology. Uh, but we get this kind of experiment. We are able to um, confirm or disprove Einstein's theory of general relativity. How do we do that? Well, take a look at the right. You see a spacecraft and the Earth, they are communicating with a radio signal. This is how spacecrafts, spacecraft work. When the radio signal passes very close to the Sun, since the space-time is curved, according to Einstein, well, it will not follow a straight line. The path will be curved. So the path will be longer, so it will arrive Sometime later, there will be a delay. We are able to measure this delay and to compare this delay to the prediction of Einstein. If they agree, Einstein was right. If they do not agree, either we are wrong, the measurements were not good, our analysis was not perfect, or, well, we're on list for the Nobel Prize. And Bepi Colombo will allow several opportunities to perform such an experiment. Another mission is to Mars. Now, I don't want to spend too much time on this because I, I want to talk to you about many other things. And Mars, as opposed to Mercury, is the most explored planet between the terrestrial planets. Um, yes, we can say that apart from the Earth is the most explored planet, actually. There are tens of missions that have explored um, Mars so far. And about 10 missions are going to Mars in the next 10 to 20 years. I want to focus on ExoMars 2022. It is an European space mission, collaboration with Roscosmos, which is the Ryan Space Mission, and the main purpose of ExoMars, the final purpose of ExoMars, is to uh, assess whether life has ever existed on Mars. Uh, it will go to look for um, organic material, and it will do this with a lander, as you see here in the foreground, and with a platform, which is the Russian contribution to the mission, in the background on the left. The lander will be able to move, because it's, a, it, it's, not, it's not just a lander, it's a rover. And it will be able to drill in depth in, in, the, in the crust of, of Mars. It will arrive up to two meters. And it's the first mission to do this. Until now, we only have had rovers with... Um, that could not go such in, in such a depth inside Mars. Let's go on. After Mars, asteroids. So here on the right, you see a very old picture. It dates 20 years back. It's from the Minor Planet Center. 
and it depicts all the known asteroids 20 years ago. Now there are many, many more. Um, I think you can distinguish the orbits of the planets. So, um, the, the main circle, light blue circle, is the orbit of Jupiter. Then inside you have the green points, which is the main belt, where there are most of the asteroids. And then inside the main belt, inside that um, donut, there are the other planets. And a number, a huge number of red dots. Now, the red dots are asteroids as well, and are called near-Earth asteroids. And they have this, they are named like this because um, they, of course, fly closer to the Sun and so to the Earth than the main belt asteroids. Asteroids are small bodies. They can be made of rocks, they can be made of iron, um, and they are fossils of the early solar system because they were uh, they, they contain the chemical composition of the early solar system and they are small only 30 of them have a diameter larger than 30 kilometers just for a comparison um, the, the earth has a, um, a radius of thousands of kilometers so they are very small Uh, these pictures, just to see the variety of asteroids that we can have. Eros, Itokawa, Ceres. Itokawa is a so-called rubble pile asteroid because, you see, there are boulders on it. It's not smooth. Its surface is not smooth. Um, it's, it's like it, it's a, uh, a pile of, um, of boulders, of rocks. Eros has got many craters and it's got this peculiar shape. Ceres is an exception. Ceres is round, is almost a sphere, we can say. And in fact, Ceres shouldn't be here. Because yes, it's true that Ceres was the first asteroid to be discovered, but now it was moved, um, it was, it was moved to being a dwarf planet. Uh, let me tell you just um, the story of the discovery of Ceres, because it involves an Italian guy called Giuseppe Piazzi, here on the left. Giuseppe Piazzi, on the night of January 1st, 1801, was making observations of the sky with his telescope and noticed this body, which was moving um, in front of the fixed stars. At first, um, he was pretty cautious. He, he knew that the body was, uh, wasn't, was no known, but already known body, was a new body. Um, first, he, he said, maybe it's, it's a comet, um, maybe it's a star, I don't know. But then, as the days went by, he made more observations, and then he got to the conclusion it was a new planet. And actually, he published the discovery of this new planet, and he called it Cerere Ferdinandea. This Ferdinandea is meaning in honor of Ferdinand IV, which was the king of Sicily at the time. Then he proposed this name to the other countries, um, and they rejected it. They rejected the Ferdinandea. And now we only in, in Italy we know Ceres as Cerere. Um, what happened next is that um, Piazzi lost Ceres. He couldn't. He wasn't able to find it anymore in the sky. Ho uh, fortunately, another guy, the one on the right, Gauss, a mathematician, among other things invented a new method for determining the orbit of a celestial body, starting with a very few observations. And thanks to his new method, they were able to uh, catch again um, Ceres and to 
uh, observe it again, and then to predict all its positions in the future. Power of mathematics. Let's go back to the missions. So I want to talk to you about four missions to asteroids. The first one is Lucy. Lucy is a mission to a kind of asteroids which I didn't talk about. And there are two groups of asteroids called the Trojans. So here you see the terrestrial planets, so the inner solar system. This is the orbit of Jupiter. This is Jupiter. Here it is. And these are the Trojans. The Trojans are two groups of satellites, of asteroids, which are more or less on the orbit of Jupiter and so are ahead of Jupiter or follow Jupiter in its orbit around the Sun. And they are very um, interesting bodies to, uh, to be studied because uh, presumably those bodies were there since the very beginning or the, the, since the formation uh, of Jupiter more or less. So they are very ancient. And this mission, Lucy, will visit seven Trojans. It will be launched in 2021 and it will end its operations in 2033. Uh, the eighth asteroid that it will visit will be a main belt asteroid. And so the main objective of Lucy is to provide new information on the state of the primordial solar system. Another space mission I'd like to talk about is Psyche. Psyche now is the name both of the, of the space mission and of the target of the space mission. There is this uh, asteroid called 16 Psyche, uh, which is peculiar because it's a metal asteroid. Now, why studying a metal asteroid? First of all, we have never studied any, any of them before. And it is particularly interesting because since planetary cores are made of iron, it could be that Psyche is something remaining, is a leftover from a former planet which was destroyed during the formation of the solar system. So Psyche will go to Psyche and try to answer this question. What's the origin of Psyche? And then, finally, go back to the near-Earth asteroids. Here, this is, uh, there are over 20,000 known near-Earth asteroids. So, those are the asteroids which fly closer to the Sun. In the, they cross the inner solar system. And if they cross the inner solar system, they cross the orbit of the Earth, possibly. And if we're unlucky enough, when, an, when a near-Earth asteroid crosses the orbit of the Earth and the Earth is at the same point, at the same time, there will be an impact. And of course we want to avoid that. There are 2,000 uh, asteroids which are considered potentially hazardous, meaning that they have to be very looked at very carefully because they could impact the Earth. They, they fly close enough that they can be um, potentially dangerous for, our, for us. So what do we do if we predict a possible impact? No, this is not the, 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 the answer, at least, uh, at, at least um, not the first answer. Armageddon, so throwing an atomic bomb to an asteroid is not the first try that we want to do. The first thing that we want to try is to send a spacecraft to um, the asteroid that we know will impact the Earth and hit it with the spacecraft. If we hit it in the right way, we will be able to change its state, its orbit, um, in such a way that in the future it will not impact the, the Earth anymore. It will change trajectory completely. But of course, we need to be sure. We need to practice this. 
How do we do this? Well, there are two space missions which will help us. The first one is DART, which will be launched around next year. It's a NASA mission, which will send a spacecraft to the binary asteroid Didymos. You see, he, you see it here on the left, Didymos A in the center and Didymos B orbiting the, the parent body. And the spacecraft will go and impact Didymos B. And hopefully, Didymos B will change its orbit. Now, five years later, five years after the impact, another space mission called HERA, this time an European space mission, European Space Agency mission, will go to the same system, will study Didymos, will study the crater that the spacecraft will have left, that the DART spacecraft will have left, and will study if the correction to the orbit, if the change in the orbit was just as predicted. And so this is our first try to see if we are able to deflect an asteroid from its trajectory, from its impactful trajectory. Let's go on. Giant planets. Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus, and Neptune. The first two are gas giants, the other are ice giants. And they are called like this for their material. The first two are made mostly of hydrogen and helium, the others are made mostly of, of ice. Um, actually, there are no planned missions specifically to these planets in the next 10 years. Um, just three years ago, the very successful mission Cassini, Cassini-Huygens actually, which was a collaboration between NASA and um, ESA, European, ESA, European Space Agency, um, just finished three years ago um, its exploration of, of Saturn, delivering a lot of information about the, its system. And we have now the mission Juno orbiting around Jupiter. Juno actually arrived in 2016 and it will end last um, next year, but it's now currently under extension, under review for extension, and if approved, it will uh, stay in orbit until 2026. And it will provide new information about the interior structure of Jupiter and its composition, as well as doing more observations of one of its Galilean moons, Io, which is the closest one. In fact, the Galilean moons are the focus of, of two space missions uh, in the next 10 years. So let me present to you Io from top, Europa, Ganymede, and Callisto. Um, let me see if I can show you this video with little audio while I speak. So the Galilean moons, um, let me say what this video represents. This video was taken uh, by the Juno mission, so the one I've just talked to you about, while it was arriving at Jupiter. And it represents the... Um, it pictures what Galileo would have seen if he could fast forward with his telescope. Here, the motion of the Galilean moons around Jupiter. This is gorgeous. And this is... The Galilean moons are very important from a, both a philosophical point of view and, a, of course, a scientific point of view. Uh, as regards the former, of course, when, when Galileo discovered the moons and realized that they were orbiting Jupiter, he practically saw a smaller solar system, a smaller solar system inside the solar system. It's a new planetary system. So how could, could, could it be that the Earth was at the center of everything? Why the Earth? Why so special? So it drastically 
dramatically change the point of view, this discovery. And of course, they are scientifically important because, for example, Europa is known to have a subsurface ocean, meaning that under its, um, its shell there is an ocean and it has plumes and since there is water, it might be ha habitable. Uh, hab habitable meaning there is water, there are the chemical components necessary for life and there is enough energy that here on Earth we get from the sun, but on Europa must come from something else. Ganymede is interesting because there is likely another subsurf subsurface ocean and it, it has a magnetic field, which is very uh, strange among satellites. And then Callisto is also important because um, it's not as dynamic as Europa and Ganymede. It's the furthest from Jupiter and it's uh, it stayed uh, the way it was formed, more or less. There is very little resurfacing, meaning the surface has not changed since a long time. So it's a photograph of the ancient, uh, of, of the formation era of the Jovian system, let's say. So they are all interesting bodies. And in fact, we are going there with two space missions. The first one is JUICE, an ESA, an ESA mission, European Space Agency which will explore Ganymede and uh, in a manner, to a manner extent Callisto in Europa and uh, Europa Clipper, uh, which is a NASA mission, which will uh, specifically explore Europa. Both have as a common uh, objective uh, to investigate the conditions for the emergence of habitable environments. Right? Let, uh, I mean, let's see if there can be life on one of them. And to do this, they will study the oceans, the composition of the, of, of the satellites, their geology. Finally, the last um, members of our family, the Kuiper Belt, the trans-Neptunian objects. It's a large population of ISA objects situated beyond the, the orbit of Neptune, as I told you before. Um, there is uh, Pluto amongst them and its moons. You see in, in the left picture Pluto, um, bottom left, and Charon, top right, um, as they were pictured by the only space mission which flew by Pluto five years ago, which was this, the New Horizons space, uh, space mission, which, was a, which is a NASA space mission. But New Horizons didn't stop to Pluto, it flew by it, but it also went to take a picture of another TNO, trans neptunian object, which you find on the right. It's called Arakov. This is the first imaged um, TNO apart from Pluto and its uh, satellites. And it's got a very interesting shape. Um, scientists have studied this body uh, extensively. There are no planned space missions to the Kuiper Belt in the, in the next 10, 10 years, of course, because it's uh, such a remote uh, area of the solar system, which is very uh, difficult to reach. Possibly, New Horizons will image another body if uh, they will be able to find a suitable target. But for the moment, this is it. Well, this concludes the first, the, almost uh, all my talk, at least concludes the next 10 years of space exploration. But you don't have a TV show episode without an anticipation of what happens next. So let me give you a glimpse of what we will expect in 20 years, or maybe 30 years. Something exciting, exciting is possibly coming up. Well, let's, we start with Dragonfly, which is a mission to Titan. Titan is the largest of Saturn's uh, moons. You see it here in the top bottom, um, sorry, in the bottom right. Uh, it will arrive in 2034, and it will literally fly on the surface uh, of Titan, which is a very interesting body 
to, to, to explore. Well, yeah. Sorry. Venus. There was a planet missing. I didn't talk at all about Venus, the goddess of love. Um, actually, um, Venus is such an inhospitable body. Uh, it's so difficult to send um, a lander on Venus because of the thick atmosphere and the harsh environment. Anything will be destroyed after one hour, hours of, uh, of use. Um, but actually, we know so little about Venus that scientists are starting to uh, get involved in designing space missions to Venus. Actually, there are many in the, uh, which are under uh, consideration at this moment. And I'm going just to talk about four of them very briefly. Veritas, which is a NASA mission to um, detailing the gravity field and the topography of Venus. Envision, which is a European Space Agency NASA mission, which is more or less, you can say, the Bepi Colombo uh, of um, uh, the Bepi Colombo, but to Venus. Then we have Havoc by NASA, which is a proposal to send aircrafts to Venus, which is very odd and I, I thought it was interesting to mention. And then, for the sake of representation, uh, you may have noticed that I haven't talked ab talk about um, any missions uh, coming from other space agencies apart from European Space Agency, uh, NASA, so the United States, uh, maybe Russia, and maybe uh, Japan. But China and um, India have their uh, space missions. Uh, as space agencies. Uh, so here uh, in the bottom right you find the illustration of uh, um, a possible Venus uh, mission from the Indian Space Agency called Shukrayan the first which will send both an orbiter if funded and uh, a balloon then Uranus and Neptune, uh, we would like to know more about them, of course. They are so far away, so difficult to reach. So it takes years and years to get there. But uh, there are so many unanswered questions about them. We, don't, we know nothing about their interior structures. Why is Neptune, which is the furthest, apparently warmer than Uranus, which is closer to the Sun? Why is Uranus' magnetic field so tilted with respect to its rotation axis? These are um, answers that we are not able to, to answer completely from here. We need an orbiter, a spacecraft orbiting these planets. And then, of course, but here we're going to space science, um, I'm sorry, to science fiction. Uh, and I'm going to anticipate some, some questions, maybe. Uh, will we ever go to Mars? Uh, a man or a woman will ever go to Mars. Um, of course, this is part of space exploration, and since there was a lot of talking about this, I, I thought I'd mention it, uh, but I will let time answer this question. Let me conclude to where we started. We started with the Voyager mission. We started from the observations from, from, of Babylon's um, of the stars. This is a picture uh, taken by the Voyager spacecraft in 1990. Um, you see maybe a dot in the middle of the, of the picture, a pale blue dot, how it was called. That is the Earth. The Voyager spacecraft was already millions and millions and millions of kilometers far from the Earth, far from the Sun, and it just looked back at Earth and took a picture. That pixel is us. 
in that pixel there is all our world or all our knowledge. And this picture inspired a famous author called Carl Sagan, who wrote these beautiful words, which I'm going to read now. Consider again that dot. That's here. That's home. That's us. The Earth is a very small stage in a vast cosmic arena. To my mind, there is perhaps no better demonstration of the folly of human conceits than this distant image of our tiny world. To me, it underscores our responsibility to deal more kindly and compassionately with one another and to preserve and cherish that pale blue dot, the only home we've ever known. So I hope that tonight I made you enthusiastic about the space exploration, but in a world affected by um, global warming, wars, hate, I think it's necessary always to look at our home. Thank you for your attention. Now I can take questions if you have any. Hopefully I will be able to answer them. Okay. Um, so French space scientist writes, uh, I fully disagree with the answer saying that other anthems are to be used. Mm -hmm. In technologies are like people on Earth, the dialysis machine, for example. How does helping people help is not a greater achievement and on the how is it something fully capitalistic? Uh, thank you for your question. It, um, actually, I agree with you. <laughs> I, I only wanted to make a joke. Um, I, uh, and I think that it worked since you uh, wrote this comment uh, because it, it allows to um, point out something very important that is um, the, the development of technology in other fields um, helps us in developing um, uh, ameliorating our everyday life. And as a mathematician, of course, I uh, fully agree with this concept. Uh, theoretical mathematics is not made for a purpose, for a practical purpose. Applications are found maybe hundreds of years later. And of course, we should nevertheless continue with uh, uh, making research in mathematics as making research in everything. So um, let, let me absolutely state that uh, I was only uh, joking and uh, of course I take back uh, my my comment that is uh, very important a very important objective of space exploration yes so, uh, she said thank you for your uh, for your answer i think it is really important to show the right impact on the population for the support for everyone even if uh, uh, like you i love uh, this way of exploration thank you uh, then how exactly will progress break up? What happens to the pieces? Well, um, it's uh, complicated to answer, but um, it has something to do with its rotation and its distance from the from the planet Mars. So um, it will get closer and closer to Mars uh, to balance a uh, physical principle. Uh, which is, uh, uh, let's say, uh, mm, so the tides are going to, uh, are dissipating some energy and in order to, um, in order to maintain, to preserve angular momentum, the, the um, Phobos is going to get closer and closer to Mars and its vicinity uh, will tear Phobos apart because 
uh, it's like the, the tides work as uh, pulling a body in two different directions oppostly. So the closer you, you are to the planet, the, the stronger you pull, and so it, it eventually it will break up. The pieces, well, I uh, imagine they will keep on orbiting, uh, some of them will keep orbiting Mars, some of them probably will, will, will follow Mars. Uh, that's hard to predict, I think. Thank you. I uh, I'm really happy that you enjoyed it. Grazie. Grazie per l'attenzione. For those of you who are part of uh, of this uh, workshop, uh, tomorrow it will, it will be the, the last day, right? Yes. So, yeah. Tomorrow, on time. Thank you and good night to all of you.